Amen. Welcome to all the visitors, and uh, it's wonderful to get together on Easter Sunday. Amen. Amen. It's nice to have you with us today if you're visiting. Um, let's just bow in a word of prayer before I start into the word today. Jesus, we just want to thank you for rising from the dead. We thank you, Lord, that you conquered sin in the grave and that you are everlasting to everlasting. You are God, Lord, and, and you have everything in your hand. So this morning, Father, as we open the, the word uh, of truth this morning, God, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would encourage different people that are here. And maybe there is someone here today that, that really has never really understood the, the message that you have uh, concerning, uh, concerning Easter. So I just pray, Father, that you would open hearts and lives to hear what your word says. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I recognize quite a few of you were at uh, Good Friday service uh, at the Evangelical Free Church, we had a, a combined service with two other churches, and wasn't that a great time? It was awesome. For those of that you were at that, it was just great. And um, we mentioned uh, we did a we did a tag team sermon where three pastors uh, brought the word to you there. And um, as mentioned at our Good Friday service on on the day of Jesus' death, the Jews were in the midst of. Uh, preparing for the Passover feast. Um, and that would have been held after sunset on uh, Friday evening. Now, um, the Jewish calendar is slightly different than our modern-day Western calendar. But um, in preparation for um, this feast on Passover, in the Law of Moses, uh, we see in Exodus chapter 12 that um, God asked the Israelites to take a Passover lamb and have the lamb slaughtered on the Friday. I guess it would be the Friday. And um, then they were to prepare a Passover meal that would occur after sundown on that same day, and they were to have a feast after sundown on the sacrificed lamb that they had, along with bitter herbs. And um, if you are familiar with the Jewish Seder meal, um, this is all to do with Passover. So um, now we, uh, in our Western mindset, have a 24-hour day that starts at midnight and ends at midnight. But the Jews had a Passover, or it had a, had a calendar where the new day would start at sundown, and it would end at sundown the next day. Now, you see, it's very important for us to understand this because there's a lot of significance spiritually to this weekend, what we're celebrating here today on Easter Sunday. There's a lot of significance to it. You see, on Passover, Preparation Day, which was Friday, that sacrifice was killed, and the sacrificial lamb was killed in honor of the night of the original Passover where the people were ordered to take the blood of their Passover sacrifice and put it over the doorposts of their homes. And the reason that was done was, was that uh, after sundown, God was going to put judgment over the whole land of Egypt. And through that judgment, um, there would be death that would come. And this blood that they put over the doorposts, okay, was a sign to the angel that came to, to destroy in that, in that context, right? That blood would be a sign to the, to, the, to the angel to pass over that household so that the people inside the house were safe. And that was the salvation that God brought through the Passover lamb. And, and every year, every year, the Jewish people um, from that time, were to celebrate the Passover um, as, 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 as an act of God's grace upon them to save them from the destroying angel that came and took the lives of the firstborn sons and, and, and uh, the firstborn males of Egypt during that time. So on the eve of the Passover, the sacrifice was made. And then... The people were eating the Passover feast on the Sabbath day. You see, because in the Jewish calendar, okay, Saturday is their Sabbath. So 
the sacrifice occurred before the Sabbath day. And then on the Sabbath day, they had the feast, and that was the night when the Passover protected them from the destroying angel that went around throughout Egypt. So it was on Saturday as a result of the wrath of God um, that Pharaoh and his household and all the Egyptians were punished, but the Israelites were protected and were set free from slavery to the Pharaoh. So they celebrated Passover and they ate this meal of lamb and bitter herbs in obedience to the word of God given to them in Exodus chapter 12. So that's just kind of a quick overview of what happened on Friday leading into Saturday. So the sacrifice was killed, and then on Saturday, the people could rest and take part of the Passover feast, part of the Passover feast of the lamb, which had actually died instead of them. They did this to remember the Lord saving them from, the, from his wrath. Okay. The sacrifice was killed, the blood was applied, the feast was prepared so that there was to be no further work done on the Sabbath day, on the Saturday, which was from sunset on our Friday evening to sunset the next day on the Saturday evening. Now, the reason I give you that preamble, because it's very important for us to understand the tie to Easter on this, okay? Passover and Easter are one and the same. God, okay, God had John the Baptist identify the Lord Jesus Christ. When he was baptizing in the river, Jesus came walking towards him. And God identified John, uh, to John the Baptist the true identity of the Lord Jesus Christ as he was coming down to the Jordan River. And he looked at Jesus and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, Jesus was the Lamb of God. He was given as our Passover sacrifice on the Friday, just as the Passover lamb was slaughtered in preparation, day for, preparation for the day of the Passover. At the time Jesus died, the skies, we, we are told in scriptures, the skies turned dark and the veil of the Jewish temple tore in two from top to bottom and Jesus gave up his spirit crying out in a loud voice, it is finished. What was finished at that time was the fact that Jesus gave his life instead of the life of the person who who deserved the wrath of God. There was grace given through Jesus Christ to whoever would put their trust in him as their Passover sacrifice. Jesus was the Passover sacrifice to end all Passover sacrifices. And after Jesus died on the cross, we're told this on, in John chapter 19, 38 to 42. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders, with Pilate's permission, he came and he took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus. Remember that guy that came to Jesus and asked what he might do to inherit eternal life, right? Jesus told him that you must be born again. The same guy, this is Nicodemus. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, and taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And we're also told in Luke chapter 23, verses 54 to 56, it was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. 
the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how the body was laying in it. Then they went home to prepare spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. So after this had occurred, there was silence and rest during the Saturday Sabbath after the crucifixion of Jesus. And the Romans posted a guard of soldiers at the mouth of the tomb, and they sealed it with the governor's seal at the request of the Jewish leaders because they feared the disciples of Jesus might steal his body. And this is the account in Matthew 27, 62, starting with 62. The next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. Now, during the time, there was quiet for that whole day. Nothing happened. The guards stood by the tomb. The tomb was sealed, and there was no commotion. There was nothing. There was a rest. But, during, but early the next morning, early the next morning, the ladies who had gone and prepared the spices for Jesus' body, they, on Sunday morning, bright and early, as soon as the, 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 the day rose, they went to the tomb to see if they could get permission to put the spices on Jesus. But this never happened. Why? Matthew's Gospel 28, starting with verse 1, tells us why. After the Sabbath... At dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for, the, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said to them. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go into Galilee, and there they will see me. <laughs> This is the purpose of what Jesus has done and still is doing today. Jesus is in the business of taking dead men and raising them back to life. And the scriptures tell us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection. And if there is a first fruit, there is other fruit that comes behind the first fruit after the first fruit. So this is very good news, my friends. You see, the Lord Jesus spoke of the far-reaching purpose of his death just before he was betrayed and sentenced to be crucified. In John chapter 11, 23 and 24, Jesus replied, The very hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it, only, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. 
You see, Jesus, Jesus knew that he was destined to bring many children to freedom from their slavery to the kingdom of the spiritual pharaoh, the devil. His purpose was to set a new kingdom up, the kingdom that Jesus authored would be a kingdom that would not end in death but would lead to everlasting life. So we know and we've heard the story of Good Friday. He was crucified on the eve of the Passover, but that wasn't the end. It was only the beginning. During his earthly ministry, Jesus explained to his disciples, he told them that he would have to be killed and raised again on the third day. In Matthew 16, 21, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And the prophecies that were given by Isaiah, the prophet, 700 years before the birth of Christ, predicted that the Messiah would be a Savior, and He would be a Savior that would suffer. He would be a Savior that would be bruised and wounded for the transgressions of the people of the world. And He would be sent like a lamb to the slaughter for the sake of bringing salvation to people who would trust in Him. Isaiah also predicted that God's Savior would not stay dead. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11, it is written, after he suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. The prophet also said in chapter 9, verse 1, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And in verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah 9, we read, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time forward and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Friends today, the truth of the gospel is this. That God the Father sent God the Son into the world not only to be the sacrifice for mankind's sin, but also to bring life to people who would believe in Him. New life. Everlasting life. Now, just before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, as recorded in John 11, 25-27, Jesus told his friends, his friend Martha, he said this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever le lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. So being true to his word, on the third day after his crucifixion, Jesus raised himself up from the dead in fulfillment of his own words in John 10, 17, and 18, which state, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. And after his resurrection and his appearance to Martha and Mary, Jesus proceeded to reveal himself to all of his disciples and, and to many others. Now over the next 40 days, he prepared his servant witnesses 
to be his ambassadors to take this message of salvation and reconciliation for humanity to the far reaches of the earth. Gathered here today, we are the recipients of the message that the apostles heralded in obedience to Christ. This is the message that I herald to you today. The same message that the apostles heralded that they received from the Lord. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2 and 6 of the privilege he had in distributing the gospel, the bread of life, to all people. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship to call all Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. See, we serve a risen Savior. Jesus is not dead. He's alive. Yeshua is alive. And he's coming back again to receive us unto himself. That, w that where he is, there we may be also. Oh, my friends, the Passover lamb was slain, but the Passover lamb brought life. This was all part of God's plan. It was the Father's way of authenticating all of the truths that were declared by Jesus. The one who believes in Jesus will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in him will never die. When you place your trust in the Lord, in his Passover sacrifice, in Jesus, life begins in you. The spirit of life, the spirit that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the heavenly realms comes and makes his home inside of you and brings you life. And that life never ends. It goes on into eternity forever and ever and ever. The mind has not thought of even the, the things. The eye hasn't seen the things that God has prepared for his people, for those that love him and are, who are called according to his purpose. It hasn't even entered into us. The glory that awaits us as believers, when we step out of this human body tent, because you're more than just flesh and bone. Your spirit is everlasting, and you have a choice to make whether you're going to have the Passover sacrifice save you from the angel of death or whether you are going to suffer the wrath of God. And Jesus loves you. God, your creator, loves you so much that he gave his, his life so that you can, ins instead of death, have everlasting life. For by grace are you saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of anything you can do. No works that you can do can earn it. God doesn't want us to be boasters of this. He wants us to be humbly appreciative and thankful to him for giving us the option of coming to eternal life in him. Oh, friends, it is such a privilege to, to be given the opportunity to live forever with the eternal God. And that's what he's given and when you take him in your spirit and you say, Lord, I need salvation. I recognize that I'm a sinner. Would you apply your, your, 
your blood to my heart because I know that you died for me and your blood can take my place. You do that. Your life will change. See, Nicodemus, that, that guy that Jesus said, you must be born again before you can enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, how can I be born again? The Bible says that you must be born of water and of spirit to be born again. And the only way that you can be born of spirit is if the Holy Spirit of God enters into you and brings life to your mortal body. And the only way that can happen is if your sins are taken care of because God is holy and he can't dwell in a place that has sin in it. So you're never going to be good enough to earn your way to God. You might be good in so many regards, but you're never going to be good enough because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there is the gift of God that is given so that eternal life can be ours. And that eternal life brings us to be at one with our Creator where there was separation and division before. Now there is at one meant atonement for us. Amen. This is the story of Easter. This is the good news. But it's not just a story. It's the reality in the book of Acts. I'm going to end with this, but in the book of Acts, we're told what happened immediately after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Luke, the apostle, writes this in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about Jesus. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented them, himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift, for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this, after saying this, he was taken up before their very sight, and a cloud, or from their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken away from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. And those apostles, those disciples, they obeyed the Lord. When Jesus rose and he ascended into heaven, they went and they waited in Jerusalem for the gift of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit fell on them, and they were filled with the Spirit. And they went out and they preached the gospel. And yes, God had to scatter them into the four corners of the earth, but, but today the same thing applies. We're, ta ta we're, we're spreading the same message. There's people that you know in your life, people that live next door to you, people that are related to you, that need to know that Jesus saves that Jesus is the Passover lamb and that there is salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. And this is the gospel that's been given to us. Jesus, the only way to have a relationship with our creator. And this is the truth that has been proclaimed through the ages. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is the truth. And in Jesus' work of salvation, there is salv in Jesus' work of salvation, there is everlasting life starting here and now for everyone who believes. Amen. Amen. And that's something to celebrate on Easter because the Lord Jesus Christ is risen. 
He is risen indeed. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. Have a happy Easter. And uh, I pray that this would be a special time for you and your family.